Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Edward. I'm an alcoholic. Um, to employers, probably a bit of a, some might call it a dry chapter, but um, it's really helped me when I went through it. Um, the way I was taken through it was the same way I was taken through every other chapter, which was basically paragraph by paragraph and how it can apply to you and then my sponsor's experience with that specific chapter and a little bit of history behind it, if there was history in that. Um, for two employers, I had to research a little bit for this one because um, I knew sort of the gist of it, but it wasn't written by Bill W, but he was probably standing over the shoulder of the guy. It was written by... It was a guy called uh, Henry Parkhurst. Um, now, I'm no historian with the big book at all. I've been sober for two and a half years. I'm still learning it all sort of thing. It's still, you know, I'm, um, I'm loving it, but, yeah, I'm not the historian some of you guys might be at um, a big book study, but... Henry Packhurst, he was basically a big wig at an oil company um, and he kept getting drunk, kept doing it, kept going back to the detox and stuff and finally they gave him the sack. Um, he's actually in the first edition of the big book. His story's The Unbeliever. So if you've ever read that, that's this guy. Uh, Bill W. 12 stepped in on his 10th round of the hospital. He met Bill. Um, as far as I understand, Henry was the fifth AA member. Um, he sort of helped write the big book in a roundabout way. He sort of helped Bill with the, the money side, the background side. Bill and Henry, as I understood, would get in a room together and they'd start talking these big ideas. Like, here's this ex-oil big rig. Here's Bill with his ideas. And they'd start talking. They're like, we're going to make hospitals. We're going to do this. We're going to change the world. Blah, 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 blah. But luckily, you know, the group conscious existed and um, that didn't happen. But the big book was one of their ideas and... The way it sort of started was they tried to get money from people and it didn't sort of work out like that, so they made shares. Um, and back in that day, as far as I understand, I'm not too good with finances, but you basically went down the post office and wrote shares out and were like, can you give me 500 bucks for these shares? And that was how they raised money for the big book to begin with. And he had one-third, Henry did, Bill had one-third, and then one-third was sort of like friends and family. Unfortunately, what happened is um, Henry busted. Um, he busted after the big book was written and they were like, we need the shares back. So Bill gave his back to the AA fellowship and Henry wouldn't. He was like, I want to hold on to these. I want the shares. I want the profits from the big book. What happened, um, I've read a few different accounts of it, but basically for 200 bucks or something, Henry was, real, he was in a state and they were able to get the shares off him for 200 bucks. Um, and he died without being sober. That was That's his story. And for me, when I heard that, I was like, and it was the same when I first heard Abby's story, which um, was, I suppose, in a roundabout way a bit similar, was that, oh, my God, like, I thought this was this perfect solution that if anyone was near it at the beginning, it was, you were the best. You were the best AA that ever existed. But um, what my sponsor says to me and all the certain members have said to me is that, you know, we're not perfect. Bill W. wasn't a perfect human being. Bob wasn't these perfect human beings. As I, in my head, I think they're just, oh, they're the most great guys in the world. They're like, no, they were alcoholics like we were, um, and they just had experiences and they put it into a book and that's what this is. And that's why this is so important to me because it's that. It's, it's something approachable that I can relate to. It's not something that's this God-given. It's like this crazy thing that you can't understand. It's approachable. And if I can read it and understand it, anyone can. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of the history. I probably am wrong. Like I probably don't know it perfectly, but that's how I understood it for this part, the two employers. Um, and, yeah, I was asked some questions about it. What was my favourite part? So on the second page, it says, here were three exceptional men lost to this world because I did not understand alcoholism as I do now. So Henry was a big wig and oil company and he had lots of employees, a lot. Um, so he had three cases which he spoke about of people basically dying. Like He was like, mate, I can't keep giving you the time off, I can't keep doing this. And three of those people ended up dying. And instead of him being like, oh, well, they didn't, well, they didn't have the steps back then, but I've heard people say, you know, they didn't have the, you know, they didn't do the steps good enough or they didn't do this good enough, he blamed himself um, because I did not understand alcoholism as I do now. And for me, when I'm 
working with others, with working with sponsees, or I meet a newcomer, I've got to set aside what I think and I, I've got to set aside everything, my ego and everything like that, because I've got to really understand where they're coming from. Even though I'm two years away from it, I've got to understand that I'm just like them. Um, and I can forget that sometimes. And that sentence there just really helps me realise that if I don't understand alcoholism enough, we can lose people. And that's um, it's part of what I think I should hold myself accountable to, is understanding more and more of it sort of thing. So I never try and stop learning. Um, and then down the bottom uh, here it says, because of the employee's special ability or his own strong personal attachment to him, the employer has sometimes kept such a man, man long beyond a reasonable period. I've had this experience. So my background is I'm a business development manager for a company. Um, I had an assistant. I've worked with other guys and I had experiences where I was asked because they knew of my connection to Alcoholics Anonymous being a sober member, there's this guy. And it was, I was about six months into this program and they were like, there's this guy who keeps coming to work drunk. And I was like, I got this one in the bag. Like I was ego gun busting. I thought I knew everything. So I went out to this guy's house, um, quickly reread this, pra- and I was like, oh, I know what to do, I know what to do, I'll just quickly, and I just basically had this book open, and then you know, I was half shaking, I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> and I was started asking him the questions, and it was basically, look, man, I'm doing this stuff in AA, I was up to steps five or six or something, I was like, I'm doing this, we go to these meetings, like, you need to come along, because in my head, I was like, well, as soon as you tell someone the solution, as soon as you tell someone that they've got the disease, bang, Bob's your uncle, they're going to be bloody coming with me because it's the greatest thing ever. That wasn't the case. It was the first time I'd hit that roadblock. I was like, mate, but don't you see? Like, you, you're going to rehab. Like, you lost your wife. You, like, don't... I, was, I didn't understand how he couldn't understand. Um, and I kept trying to explain it different ways in my experience, and it, nothing was getting through to him. Um, and it was really sad. So the next day, he came to work and drunk again. They sent him home and I went back and I sort of did it again and um, I didn't know what to do. And there was a part in this chapter specifically that I disagreed with and that was where it says, here, sometimes kept such a man at work long beyond a reasonable period. I was like, keep him on until he's cured, until he's ready and until he's sober, we've got to keep him employed. And it just, it just isn't the case. You just can't do that. Um, you've got to push them to their bottom. And that was something I couldn't agree with until I had read this, spoke to my sponsor, spoke to older sober members, prayed on it, spoke to my high power. And, yeah, it was like oh, I had to talk to my boss and be like, this guy's not willing at all. He won't come to meetings with me. He won't practice the steps. He's not doing it. Like, there is a solution on offer. I've tried this. I've done that. That's what I can do. He's, he's not I don't know what else he's going to do, but as far as AA is concerned, he's not interested in getting sober through AA. And um, my boss sacked him. And uh, I felt so guilty about it. Um, But it was, as far as I understand, and what's been told to me, it was the right thing to do. Because we will be this stopgap, and I can be that. People can walk all over me, and I can lend them money, and I can keep doing this, but they're not willing to do the work. And if they're not, as far as an employer is concerned, like, we we should hit our bottom. Like, we should be pushed towards our bottom almost, because that's the best thing for us. Um... And I personally believe that's what I did for that guy. Um, I'm still friends with him. He's not sober currently, but, you know, God willing, one day. Yeah, and then the next page, there's a little line, and he's talking about um, some in- instances where he spoke, speaks to, like, big wigs about his alcoholism, and they hear what he's saying, and they go, mm, I'm not going to use that for my employees. And one line here, it says, this chap is either through with liquor or he is minus a job. If he has your will, power, and guts... He will make the grade. I wanted to throw my hands up in discouragement. The thing I got out of that was that I personally have been told by friends, by family, they'll pat me on the back. They won't really understand this. And they'll be like, Ed, it is so great how strong-willed you are, how good of a person you are for doing these things, how great you are. And it's fucking really hard to be like, it's not me at all. Like, I've really got to understand it is not me. Like, the reason I'm sober isn't because I'm such a good person and I wanted to do the steps and apologise to all the people I hurt. It's because my higher power's done it for me. Like, I couldn't get sober any other way. Like, it was a question of morality. I mean, I tried to do all these moral things when I was drinking. That didn't keep me sober. It's, I've got to remember, if he has your willpower and guts, he will make the great. That's not true. As far as that is concerned, it is not that. 
that is not what's on question here. And I really like that line because it just helps remind me. And just like, Ed, as soon as someone's patting you on the back about something, just give it away. Just say, it's not me. Um, and it really isn't, but I've got to remember that. Um, yeah, lack of understanding as to what really ails the alcoholic and lack of knowledge as to what employers might prof might profitably take in salvaging their sick employees. Like, we've got to really understand that we are detrimental to a business when we're drinking. Like, I was, a, I was in sales, and when I was drinking, I was not a good salesman. Could you imagine me rocking up to your place of business trying to sell you something half-cut, hungover, bleeding nose from the night, like something, like, it was just so detrimental and my boss used to give me chance after chance after chance after chance after chance and reading this it really put me into thing like what he was going having to go through but he didn't understand what was going on with me um he didn't find me which is you know god willing it was great but maybe he should have and i would have got here quicker i don't know but that's just not what happened to me yeah, and when dealing with an alcoholic down the bottom, there may be a natural annoyance that a man could be so weak, stupid, and irresponsible, even when you understand the malady better, you may feel this feeling rising. I know for me personally, I've worked with newcomers, sponsees, and I've felt this. I've read this book a few times. I've gone to a few meetings. I've been here two and a half years. I, can, I personally can get that, and I feel bad about that, but it's like it's just what happens because I'm like, well, mate, you know your problem, Here's a solution, do it. And it's like, that is not at all what it suggests in this book. But I'll get on my high horse and think that. I'll get annoyed. And it's just like, why am I doing this? Um, and it's just because it's my ego and stuff. And I've just got to keep taking that step back and go, these are sick people we're dealing with. And then it gets on to, what are we going to skip to? On page 142, it starts going into really, really, really specific ways to deal with. And this is honest to God what I did with this employee. Um, so I went to him and I said, if he is gravely ill, fatally ill, and when I explain a bit of what it means, you know, a bit the, the doctor's opinion, the uh, physical allergy to this, that, and he's like, yep, yeah, yep, I've got that. I've been to rehab this many times. Actually, I was sponsoring a guy <clears throat> and we sat down and he handed me this letter from the hospital. His doctor had said, if you ever drink alcohol again, you will die. 100% you will die if you ever drink alcohol again. And it, I saw this and we were reading it together and I was like, okay, all right, well, would you agree we're gravely ill? And he was like, yep, definitely. I was like, this physical. And he was like, I agree with that, I agree with that. Um, I said, do you want to get well? And he was like, 100%. Um, do you? Will you take every necessary step, submit to anything to get well, to stop drinking forever? That's where he stopped. He said, I'll be willing to do anything. I'll do the steps. You know, I'll, I'll make amends to that. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. But to stop drinking forever, he was, he just saw this one second of doubt. There's apprehension there. And I was like, well, wait, what was that? And he was like, well, you know, I just think maybe if I do this AA thing for a year, maybe two years, then I'll be able to have a few beers at Christmas time or something. I was like, man, I was, it, again, that same thing came back, that slight annoyance. I was like, here is a letter from a doctor telling you you're going to die. Um, I can't, I was like, I can't, like, he's a doctor. I'm just a fucking random alcoholic who sells stuff. Like, what am I? I was like, but that's a doctor. And he just was like, nope, like maybe. And it says here, we believe a man should be thoroughly probed on these points. Be satisfied he is not deceiving himself or you. And I ignored this part. I, re I knew this about this part of the book. And I was like, you know what? You know, he said he's willing. And he said maybe in a year. I said, you know what? I'll ignore that, what he's just said, and I'll start taking him through the steps. And I'm sure by the time we get to some step, he's going to have a psychic change. It's going to be all perfect. Um, and as you guys can guess, he went back out, he busted. And what someone had explained to me is this guy was fooling you. Like you weren't essentially giving him money, but you're giving him lifts places, you were doing this, but he just he wasn't ready at all. He wasn't willing to do any of the work. And he had apprehension and he thought maybe he could drink again. And it's just... If you don't believe that, you have to be obliterated with the belief that you can never drink again. Otherwise, doing this stuff, I mean, it is. I love doing the steps, but that, it isn't easy. Like, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy to go through them. Then we go some more into it. If he temporizes and still thinks he can ever drink again, even beer, he might as well be discharged after the next bender. And again, getting back to the work stuff, is that, yeah, we can't hang on to 
drunken employees. We give them the benefit of the doubt. We give them, I don't like calling it a second chance because by the time we get to AA, we've probably had, I don't know, what, 50, 60, 70 chances. Um, I heard, yeah, when someone explained it to me, I was like, this is my second chance. He's like, oh, mate, I'm sure you have a lot more than that. Um, if we're not dealing with someone, it says either you are dealing with a man who can and will get well or you are not. If not, why waste time on him? So we have a limited amount of time and resources on this earth. We, as members of Alcoholics Anonymous, can sponsor a set amount of people just because that's how time works. Um, and at the end of the day, either you are dealing with a man who can and will get well or you are not. If not, why waste time on him? And I thought that was harsh until I started working with guys and I'd drive, drive like two hours to this guy's house and he was like, yep, let's get to step four, let's do it. I get there and he's drunk. And I'm just like, mate, what the... Like, I was just like, all right, well, that's what you wanted to do. And then, yeah, it starts going into a bit more extra detail what to do with employees. So, a certain amount of physical treatment is desirable, even imperative. Be referred to your own doctor. None of us are doctors in AA. I'm not a doctor. I know very little. So, always push him towards doctors. With um, another guy I worked with, yeah, pushed him towards it. He went to a rehab and he didn't straighten out, but it was what his doctor suggested. So, he wasn't willing to do the steps. He was willing to do that. And I was like, whatever, mate. Um, your man will fare better if placed in such physical condition that he can think straight and no longer craves liquor. If you propose such a procedure to him, it may well be necessary to advance the cost of treatment, but we believe it should be plain that any expense will later be deducted from his pay. It is better for him to feel fully responsible. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't. it doesn't happen much in Australia, but overseas, apparently, you can get put into rehabs by your business. They'll put you in there. Um, and here it's just, I don't know if you guys have businesses, but any expense will later be deducted from its pay. For me, when I look at myself, is I look at how many chances I've been given by people, and when I go out and make amends, it's not just saying sorry, it's repaying that. So I did a lot of work where I was getting paid, and I wasn't working. I was half cut, I was hung over. So financial amends to the old businesses I used to work for, that's the thing. Um, that's where that comes from. I have to repay all the friends that gave me, you know, cheeky bits of money and stuff when I had none when we were going out. I had to go through each and every one and try and find a number figure and be like, this is how much I want to give back to you. Any expense will later be deducted from his pay. That's how I push it back on myself. And then it goes on, physical treatment is but a small part of the picture. Now, I've met guys who are like, I go for runs every morning, now I'm going to get sober, and that's it. I'm going to fucking go to the gym, and this is it, and that's just everything. And it just says, it's a small part of the picture. And it just sort of puts it all into perspective of what the whole thing is. He should understand that he must undergo a change of heart. Look at the appendix for a spiritual experience. I think that's what that's meaning there. To get over drinking will require a transformation of thought and attitude. Again, spiritual experience. We all had to place recovery above everything. For without recovery, we would have lost both home and business. Yeah, 100%. That is just so true. If I put anything above my recovery, I'll drink and I'll die. I can guarantee it. Um, with work, I'll get a bit too busy and I'll put that before my recovery. I'll start getting a bit resentful. I don't know where that'll lead, but I can guess. And yeah, and that's what I got out of that part. Um, again, the treatment have out to undertaken will never be discussed without his consent. Gossip. Um, it's brought up a few times in here, but I don't know, you're here in rooms and you see, I don't see it often, but you hear about it, people gossiping. A newcomer comes in, tells a heavy story, some people hear about it, make a joke, and then it's just like, that can hurt someone to the point that they'll go back out and drink. So I never share someone's four step stuff with me, any step nine, any stuff I hear, unless it's given their consent. They say, yeah, yeah, like, don't use my name or anything, but you can tell my story if it helps. Because I don't have experiences with everything in AA. There's lots of different experiences people have had, and to talk about the solution and to talk about the illness, um, it's good to have different experiences shared. How am I going for time? Am I over? Oh, five minutes. Thank you. Oh, thank God. Um, and then 144, by no means do we offer it as the last word on this subject, but so far as we are concerned, it has worked for us. And that's the beauty of the big book. It ta tells you time and time again that it's like, we're not omnipotent. This isn't like some Bible word of God or anything. This is a textbook. As if you're learning maths for the first time, you're going to need a textbook. And that's what the big book is. And I know this might sound mean, but it's like if you haven't done the 12 from the textbook with the sponsor, sort of like that, it's sort of like, well, have you just looked at it on the wall and just thought, oh, maybe I can understand it that way? Because I sort of did that, and it wasn't until someone took it through 
this textbook with me that it started working or I started getting more and more results. Yeah. You are betting, of course, that your changed attitude plus the contents of this book will turn the trick. In some cases it will and in others it may not. It's not in this passage, but it's in a part of the book. Um, I think it comes later and someone might bring it up. It's not me getting up every morning, doing the meditation and like doing my morning review and then bloody reading the book and doing the steps that keeps me sober. It is not. It is my higher power. Like it truly is being taken away from me. And I've, it's, it's hard to explain. Like I've met some secular people and stuff and I try and put it in the words of like my willingness gets me there. It's that thoughts, it's that peace, contentment that I find from these books, from this book that keeps me there. But to get, say, sober and to not have that obsession about alcohol and stuff, well, that's not, that's not me at all. It's just nothing to do with me. That is just my higher power taking that away. What I can do is put myself in the best position to have that taken away easily sort of thing. And that, for me, is doing the steps, doing the stuff. And we all know what the stuff is. Like, if we're coming to a big book study, I'm guessing you guys get drilled about what the stuff is. Um, a great deal can be accomplished by the use of this book alone. A hundred percent. Like, for me, with steps and working with people, it's like if I don't have it coming from this book or if I can't refer back to how I've heard it from this book, then I'm sort of like, ah, well, I don't really need to use that or talk about that. That's just me personally. A little bit further on, um, it talks about gossip again. So a malicious individual was always making friendly little jokes about an alcoholic's drinking exploits. In another case, an alcoholic was sent to hospital for treatment. Within a short time, it was a billboard. This sort of thing decreased the man's chance of recovery. What happens in here stays in here 100%. It's just, like, I've said stuff in here that's, like, real heavy. And if someone repeated that, I'd feel ashamed and I wouldn't want to come back to that meeting. I wouldn't see, I'd feel guilty and I'd be like, oh, but they hate me because of that. So it's, you, you don't, I don't, try and go out of my way to gossip. Um, if people bust, I couldn't care less as long as they're back. If they're safe and happy, that's all I care about. If you bust, man, whatever. Um, as I Keep coming back if you want to. Yeah, always defend a man from needless provocation, unfair criticism. Gossip's one, but stopping the gossip. Be like, guys, I know this person. I know that person. Like, You might not agree with what they've done, but don't keep going with it. Um, I'm running out of time here. Uh, how do I interpret it? So that was another question came up. Uh, how to treat sponsees. So when I read to employers with sponsees, I interpret it as a way to talk with your sponsees. Also with, um, with, how, with the people you work with. Another thing that comes up anytime I read to employers is a saying in a different fellowship called Al-Anon. Um, it's called detaching with love. Like they will be put in situations where they have to deal with us, which is not fun. As we all know, alcoholics are not the greatest people to be around an active addiction. Um, just like employers, just like our family, just like anyone, detaching with love, firing us if need be, getting rid of us, pushing us to our bottom quicker, without a pillow, under their bum, that is the best thing we can do for people like us. I know I wouldn't be here if people didn't tell me the things that they told me. You know what I mean? If everyone told me, ah, oh, your drinking's fine, it's all this, it's all that, I wouldn't be here today. I need people to be harsh with me for me to remain in the rooms. For me to come to the rooms, it was that. I needed to hit a bottom. Um, and that's the truth of it. I needed to be beat up enough that I was willing to do anything, which was one was to accept a higher power or even think about accepting a higher power. And I had to be pretty beat up to be there. Um, yeah. And then I suppose the last thing I like to talk about in this part, it is not expected that an alcoholic employee will receive a disproportionate amount of time and attention. The right kind of man, the kind who recovers, will not want this sort of thing. He will not impose. Far from it. He will work like the devil and thank you to his dying day. That's how I want to be to my sponsor. That's how I want to be to my employers. That's how I want to act and behave within Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I want to work hard at the program, work like the devil, and thank you to my dying day. Every time I call my sponsor, I say, thanks for taking my call. Every time I talk to my grand sponsor, thanks for taking my call. Every time I talk to a sponsee, thanks for taking the call sort of thing. Every time I talk to someone in AM, I'm like, thank you for your time, because that's what they're giving me. They're giving me time. When I work with a sponsee or a sponsor, that's giving me my life back. That's quite literally giving me time. Um, yeah, I think I'll shut up for now, but thanks for having me. Have you got something out of that?
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.